the die cavity. Also on the die, there are vents uh, which allow all of the gases uh, to come out because one of the main uh, properties of permanent mold castings is that they are porous free and uh, they are a pressure tight casting. The picture also shows roughly what the, the part would look like that comes out of this uh, tool set. The, the two halves um, are pulled together and then clamped using the clamp that you can see on the right hand side. As Doug said earlier, it's um, a pretty manual uh, process. The actual molding process, the two halves of the die are sprayed with a mold lubricant to help release the, the part after it's been poured in. The mold is initially heated to about 500 uh, degrees using gas burners. The mold temperature does rise during the, the casting process as you cast more and more parts. So for higher volumes, the, the molds can be water cooled. The die halves are clamped together and then the molten metal is poured in at approximately uh, 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the, as I said before, the, the metal is poured into the uh, pouring basin. So as we pour that metal in, we have to allow it to go from a, a liquid state, you know, viscosity into a uh, solid part or what we call solidified. Typically it takes eight to 10 seconds on an average, but it can vary depending on wall thicknesses, the alloy, um, there's varying different things that can offend that. But, but essentially uh, we're taking a, a liquefied, you know, furnished metal, pouring it into a, a cavity and we need to allow it to solidify so we can pull it back out. So once it's become hardened, and again, we calculate this, we open the die back up and we pull it back out of the die and restart the process. After the fact, we take that part and it's then fettled. Uh, we basically remove the runner and any flash or uh, any other um, in information or things that we see on the die that shouldn't be there. In permanent molding, um, at Bunting at least, we are primarily a bronze permanent molding house and we do some aluminum uh, alloys. Um, as you can see by the chart, there are a number of different alloys that can be um, permanent molded, but we do have limitations. Um, because of the process and the flow of metal into the dies, there are certain metals that we simply can't continuous or we can't permanent mold because there are limitations on how it will flow through the die as far as creating uh, voids and other issues. So this is a good listing of alloys that we would typically see. You'll notice, for instance, uh, 932 is not on this, lead, on this uh, list. It's a leaded alloy. It does not um, allow itself really to be permanent molded. So there are limitations on alloys. Most of the alloys that you'll see are what we call short freezing range alloys. Correct. Yep. So kind of the whole reason for doing this. Uh, permanent molding is probably a um, competency that most of you probably don't recognize bunting um, for. It is something we've done for many, many, many years. Um, it is a way to uh, design and manufacture a part to a near shape set of dimensions. Um, and it's much more cost effective to do this for certain applications where we can get a near shape and only have some machining required to no machine required, depending on what it is. So, so we're hoping to give you a little insight to this particular process. Again, it's probably something most of you aren't that familiar with, but it's something we've done for a lot of years. So why, you know, why do, why do people do it? There's typically a number of reasons why people decide to sand cast, permanent mold, die cast, investment cast, and so on and so on. You know, generally you're looking at the geometry of the part, the speed at which you need to make it. You know, if it's something you're making 300 parts a year versus 3 million parts a year, it's gonna dictate what process you want. Tolerances, uh, we, can, we can hold certain tolerances as a near shape product. Machining requirements, you know, we can add or take away machining requirements depending on what you pick. Tooling costs, um, permanent molding requires a steel die. Clearly there's some machining. Sand casting does not have a steel die. Um, so there's different costs. Die casts are generally more expensive than a permanent mold typically. Um, so again, there's a lot of reasons why you might pick one of these molding processes to, uh, to get into the bronze marketplace. So benefits, why would you do permanent mold or other, other um, opportunities? It's, it really does have a rapid solidification which creates a fine grain structure similar to continuous cast and some of the other things that you're familiar with. 
So we do pick up a very superior metallurgical and mechanical set of properties in comparison to sand, because sand does not have a metal dye, it's a sand. Um, heat isn't taken away as quickly um, in sand as it is in metal, so we can get a better uh, brain structure and so forth. So there's a lot of enhancements having a steel dye over a sand cast uh, dye. Smooth filling. Um, gate designs are really important in this process. Uh, because of our designs, we're allowed, we can affect or, or disinfect uh, the turbulence that's created in trying to minimize inclusions or, or um, uh, things that we don't want to have in a molded part. For instance, at a cross section, we want to try to minimize how much air gap we have. So we do things with, uh, with the filling solution on the die. And that is, again, part of the runner and the die design. Near shape. Again, we can take a part that is, uh, we can design a mold with a cavity to mimic the uh, geometry of a part, and we can pour it in, and create a net shaped part versus having to take, say, for instance, a large rectangular continuous cast piece of alloy and have to machine something out of it. So we can actually go near shape, which obviously can save a lot of money if the application fits within the other demands. Excellent surface finish. Um, we typically run between 100 and 200 RMS. For most applications, that's a, that, that works. Uh, and surfaces that require a better um, finish, those can certainly be polished, machined, or whatever needs to be done. But again, at, coming right out of the die, it has a very nice finish. Most people are surprised how nice it looks. Dimensional control. The dies allow us um, really close dimensional tolerances. Because we're casting it in a steel die, it's fairly fixed. Over time, the die will start to wear, but we monitor that. So it's not uncommon us for have a poured tolerance of plus or minus two thousandths, which for a lot of applications, especially non-critical surfaces, that's more than adequate. Um, the dies have um, Fewer casting variables than sand for obvious reasons, which makes it uh, really making producing a very uniform part. Uh, section thickness. In other words, we're talking about how thick the walls are. Um, we can go as small as about an eighth of an inch. It starts to push the limits, honestly, and it really depends on the material and the part design. Um, with some as thin as 90 thousandths, actually. But again, we try to, to get a little thicker. Uh, but we and as as thick as two inches. But one of the things we find in permanent mold is we wanted to maintain a fairly consistent wall thickness throughout the part as much as we can because it does have an effect on turbulence and flow within the die. Cast holes. We can definitely cast um, through holes on the parts. Uh, for us, we're down to about 187 thousandths, um, and we can hold a tolerance of about three thousand plus or minus three thousandths. Again, because it is a steel die, we can hold location uh, very well. Um, and many times that, that eliminates the need to have to drill holes. And many times we can take a part and simply tap it, it's done. So again, we don't have an extra machining step. Metal inserts. Um, if there's a requirement for some kind of a um, insert or an overmold type of um, idea, we can actually insert, for instance, we do a job that we put a metal shaft in, overmold it, so when that bronze part comes out, it has the shaft extending from the part. It's all molded in and uh, obviously saves a lot of time and money and then allows them to achieve their desired results. Environmentally friendly. With the permanent mold process, all the gates and scrap are recycled throughout our own furnaces. That's obviously a cost benefit uh, in a lot of ways. And there's no contaminated sand to deal with, which again is a whole nother ball of uh, wax. And uh, typically, permanent mold alloys contain no lead for the folks. Obviously, that's becoming a pretty big deal these days. OK, so down to our parameters. Um, at Bunting, the, the volume per annum is, the minimum is around about 400, uh, 500. And we go up to 400,000 uh, parts per, per annum. But that, those all depend on the size. The maximum size that we can do in any one uh, direction is 15 inches and the minimum is three eighths. Uh, our weight, our maximum weight we can do is about 15 pounds. But as I said, some other producers we know that can go up to uh, 400 pounds. And the minimum weight we do is about four ounces. So we go from very small to, to pretty large parts. 
as Doug said before, we tried to keep the uh, the wall thicknesses um, even throughout the part to uh, to give us a better part and cut down the turbulence in the tool. But we can go to a maximum wall thickness of about two inches, and we can go down as thin as an eighth of an inch. These uh, give you this gives you an idea of some of the markets that we're dealing with. So that's a wide range of markets uh, from welding e equipment to CNC machines. ATM machines, um, pneumatic equipment, furniture, pumps, forestry equipment. Um, so there's a whole range of uh, markets out there uh, for you to, to attack when you're trying to sell them the, the bronze bar or aluminum bars or steel bars. Uh, there's a lot of components that we can make for the, all of these different industries. As an example, just I, you know, I know a lot of people think, well, where can I use this or how can I use this to sell more product within your companies? Um, as an example, I was in a machine rebuilders facility a few years ago, and I noticed they were making some L-shaped um, wear plates for a pretty large volume rebuilding process they were doing. And I noticed in the in this wear plate was about three inches wide by about two inches um, in width and oh, somewhere around six or seven inches long. And they were literally taking a, a, a standard rectangle size alloy and machining this this L-shaped essentially wear plate. And we got to talking and I said, boy, have you ever considered permanent mold? And the gentleman wasn't familiar with that. So we ended up sitting down, taking his part, the, the print that he was making it to, and I got it quoted as a permanent mold. And end of the day, you would not believe how much money we saved this gentleman, because essentially I was able to um, permanent mold this part to the dimensions that were required, because it wasn't that tight of a tolerance and all we had to do was drill two, or I'm sorry, tap two holes that were in the side plate that how it was connected to the main housing. And this was a pretty large volume opportunity. So this gentleman for about three years was literally buying a really large rectangular plate and doing all this machining. He had well over 60% chip coming off this uh, machine. And we were able to turn this to a permanent mold. It saved him absolute ton. And quite frankly, it was probably a better part. So it's one of those things where you have to look at when you're into shops and your people are, are walking through plants and shops and talking to buyers. Um, it's amazing how many different kinds of opportunities there are to quite plain save them money and quite frankly, at the end of the day, provide opportunities for you and your company. So there are lots of different ways to attack it. The way to think of it really, if you look at the picture in the front page, it's a near shape cast part. So you can look at some of those parts and imagine if you had to machine those out of some round stock or some rectangular stock. So you can imagine um, what kind of savings there can be. The key is it has to be some volume to get over the capital investment up front. That's really the nook and cranny and obviously meet the mechanical requirements. Okay, um, that's basically from us. Uh, we are open for the questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have not had any questions come in at the moment, but I will remind everyone that you can type in your questions at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. 